Te Fa Niente by Gustav Fitzer, translated by Alfred Baskerville, Coffee Break Collection Thirty Three, Gardening, recording by Newgate Novelist. Dolce Fa Niente. Beneath the dark cypress in roseate bowers, forgotten all toil and the mart's busy hours to sip from the goblet of crystal o'erflowing the sweets of the nectar the cooling the glowing to list to the bees with melodious humming the echo of bells ever going and coming from the blush of the morn till the sunbeam descendeth oh know ye the rapture that leisure attendeth to rock in the skiff the blue heavens beholding to skim by the shore its bright verdure unfolding to gaze at the fishes that sport in the shallow the speckled with crimson the purple the yellow to list to the billows their gossip repeating the wail of the slow and the laugh of the fleeting how sweet mid enjoyments with rapture thus teeming to while away moments half waking half dreaming to choose amid thousands of roses sweet smelling to count the peach blossoms now budding and swelling to list to the nightingale's accents so tender the moan of the poplars in language to render in the crimson-tipped clouds of the even beholding bright visions each moment new features unfolding oh might i but linger i never should weary not to me would the day not the longest be dreary and be not forgotten the crown of my leisure fair maidens who smile neath their frown of displeasure who rail at the dreamy delights that befriend me yet fain would with food the most delicate tend me and pity the weary one as he reposes and laurel o'ershadowed would bed me in roses and forgetting the sweets of the sugar to offer the sweeter delights of their kisses would proffer i hear from afar that by sages i'm taunted for having thus leisure audaciously vaunted tis true ye can fast but enjoyment denying ye toil neath your burden half vainly half sighing ere willing are ye to be mending and teaching to titania's fairies e'en morals be preaching your fears and your longings life's garland concealing ye know not the sweet sweet enjoyments of feeling yet think not mine eye like the sluggards reposes in vain on the wonders which nature discloses like the beam of the sun from the ruby so gleaming by night from the soul rise the sparks ever beaming in the revelling joys of the hoary diffuses her accents sweet song the fair child of the muses gay cheerful fantastic she trips to the measure and wears on her brow the bright garland of leisure end of dolce far niente this librivox recording is in the public domain some gardening experiments by s leonard bastin coffee break collection thirty three gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org some gardening experiments at a time when britain is in a fair way to become a nation of gardeners it may be of interest to introduce to the readers of the strand 
a few novelties in which the amateur grower may engage the early ripening of fruit is often much to be desired with apples pears plums and similar kinds this is not a difficult matter all that is necessary is to select a branch on which the fruit is well set on the lower part of the bough cut a ring entirely round the stem by this means the return flow of the sap to the lower parts of the tree is in a measure prevented and the branch as a whole will be much enriched it will be found that the fruit on this part will be remarkably fine and moreover will be ripe many weeks before the usual time no harm will result to the tree if at the next season when the bark descends to cover up the space the union of the two parts is assisted by the cutting of the edges clean at the point of junction in connection with fruit growing one may introduce a very novel plan of securing big gooseberries of course this fruit contains an immense amount of water and it is possible to bring about a very large increase in the quantity of the juice secure a number of tin lids and place these round the bush supporting them with bricks or inverted pots each little pan is to be filled with water and the gooseberry branches pulled over so that the tips of the fruit just touch the liquid the pans are kept regularly supplied with clean water and the grower will be astonished at the rapidity with which the gooseberries drink up the moisture very soon they will reach a monstrous size which may well be two or three times that of the fruit grown in the usual manner for those gardeners who are fond of curiosities there is perhaps nothing more singular than fruit photography for this there is no subject so good as the apple it is only necessary to prepare some paper stencils which any one may cut out according to his own fancy these should be made of fairly thin paper and may take the form of a portrait a coat of arms or other figure the fruits which it is desired to treat should be as perfect as possible when they are nearly mature but before they have turned colour in any way they should be enclosed in paper bags directly the apple has attained to its full size the stencil must be stuck with pure starch paste upon the cheek of the apple which will get the greatest amount of sun the skin of the apple should have become fully red before the stencil is removed when if all has gone well it will be seen that there is a very clear imprint standing up against a reddish background if the stencil should have been washed off by rain it may be possible to replace it at any rate during the early stages of the progress a novel experiment is that of growing two hyacinth bulbs together two bulbs are selected which are known to flower about the same time although in other respects the more diverse they are the better each is cut from the crown to the base with a sharp knife in such a way that the central shoot is exposed but not injured the two larger portions of the bulbs are then tied together the cut portions facing one another the double bulb is then potted as shown in the accompanying illustration if all has gone well a single stem comes up while the flower may be blue on one side and pink on the other according to the colours of the bulbs the result is highly mystifying to gardeners who are not in the know the experiment is often carried out by the dutch growers and rarely fails if carefully executed while on the subject of bulbs it may interest those who like novelties to point out that the roots of the autumn crocus if placed on a warm mantel shelf will produce abundance of flowers without any soil or water whatever the time of year for purchasing the bulbs for this treatment is about august some gardeners are very fond of training their plants into all sorts of designs a standard violet is a novelty which is not really difficult to produce violet plants should be secured and potted in the usual manner one runner from each plant should be selected and all side shoots of any description pinched away the runner is trained up to a support and if only the top bud is allowed to develop this will presently break into an abundance of flower and foliage as shown in the photograph on the previous page 
there are many interesting possibilities in cactus grafting these strange plants are curiously tolerant of cutting and can be fashioned into all sorts of weird shapes the annexed illustrations show a singular cactus graft which has been produced in the following manner the three uprights are formed of rooted portions of pereschia a species of cactus which is usually employed as the stock of the graft whilst the upper portion is a piece cut from the sea urchin cactus the union between the two plants is quite complete and it is very likely that this weird specimen will flower any florist will supply the rooted pereschia stocks for grafting whilst all kinds of cacti may be employed for grafting to the stocks the only essential point to bear in mind is that to effect a proper union there must be newly cut surfaces facing one another until the union is complete the graft and the stock may be bound together some distinctly interesting experiments are possible in connection with the changing of the colours of flowers many kinds of white flowers such as lilies of the valley hyacinths narcissi and almost any variety with a succulent stem may be altered in this respect all that is necessary is to steep the freshly cut stems in a strong solution of an aniline dye red ink is a good form of one of the brightest of these dyes and an hour or so after placing the stalks in this material the petals of the blooms will have become vividly pink the well-known green carnations and similar novelties are produced in this manner the only difference being the colour of the dye in conclusion one may offer a method of preserving roses which in years gone by was commonly adopted well-developed buds are gathered and the cut end of the stalk is dipped in liquid wax until it is completely sealed each bud is then wrapped in tissue paper and packed away in a well-fitting box in this state the buds may be left for months and when it is desired to expand them cut away the waxed end and place the stem in water which has been slightly warmed end of some gardening experiments making a giant pumpkin by s leonard bastin coffee break collection 33 gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org making a giant pumpkin to grow something bigger than has ever been produced before seems to be the ambition of the average gardener a large flower a huge fruit or a particularly corpulent vegetable is certain to catch the eye of those impartial gentlemen who act as judges at the show and a first prize label is affixed to the exhibit now if you want to stagger the horticultural world you cannot do better than follow the advice given in this article by means of which a pumpkin of colossal proportions may be grown the experiment is a most fascinating one as the writer can testify pumpkin plants are of course raised from seed each year garden books say that the best plan is to sow the seed separately in small pots in april a certain amount of heat is needed and if this is not available the seeds might be raised for one by a professional gardener the plants will be ready for putting out of doors when there is no further fear of frost say towards the end of may a raised bed of rich soil is desirable and a sunny position should be chosen with the coming of the warm days the pumpkin plants will start to grow very rapidly and it will not be long before they are in flower as the fruit sets plenty of water should be supplied if the weather is dry and everything needful done to secure a free growth when the pumpkins have grown to about the size of one's fist a healthy fruit may be taken in hand to get very large examples it is a good plan to allow only two pumpkins to each plant all the rest should be prevented from growing by nipping them off as soon as they appear now prepare a strong sugar solution this is quite easily done by heating some water just to the point at which the sugar will dissolve put the sugar in until the water begins to thicken 
but do not boil the mixture or it will become syrupy when you think you have secured a really strong solution place this aside in a jar to cool the next thing is to get some round lamp wick or any thick lengths of cotton substance would answer the purpose as well the sugar solution must now be put into one or more jars and these are grouped into convenient positions round the pumpkin now cut up the cotton wick or whatever the material may be into lengths which will reach from the stalk of the pumpkin to the sugar mixture in the jars with a penknife bore a hole into the flesh of the stalk just large enough to take one end of the wick when this is inserted the other end must be immersed in the sugar solution you will thus have a complete connection between the stalks of the pumpkin and the sugar solution as has been indicated two or even more jars may be placed round the pumpkin and from each a connection can be made naturally the stem of the fruit should not be cut about too much as this might affect the well-being of the gourd some idea of the manner of carrying out the plan may be gathered from a glance at the photographs on the preceding page given a spell of nice warm weather you will receive a daily shock when you go out into the garden to see how the pumpkins are getting on the rate of growth is simply astonishing and this is of course chiefly due to the fact that the pumpkins are sucking up the sugar solution as fast as they can through the cotton wicks now and again it is a good plan to stir the mixture in the jars and of course the ends of the wicks must always be immersed as the solution disappears fresh sugar and water must be added meanwhile the pumpkins go on growing until they become positively colossal indeed within certain limits it is difficult to say how large a pumpkin might not become under this treatment End of Making a Giant Pumpkin The Glory of the Garden by Rudyard Kipling Coffee Break Collection 33 Gardening Recording by Patrick Wallace The Glory of the Garden Our England is a garden that is full of stately views of borders, beds and shrubberies and lawns and avenues with statues on the terraces and peacocks strutting by but the glory of the garden lies in more than meets the eye for where the old thick laurels grow along the thin red wall you'll find the tool and potting sheds which are the heart of all the cold frames and the hothouses the dung pits and the tank the rollers carts and drain pipes with the barrows and the planks and there you'll see the gardeners, the men and prentice boys told off to do as they are bid, and do it without noise. For, except when seeds are planted and we shout to scare the birds, the glory of the garden, it abideth not in words. And some can pop begonias, and some can bud a rose, and some are hardly fit to trust with anything that grows. But they can roll and trim the lawns, and sift the sand and loam, for the glory of the garden occupieth all who come. Our England is a garden, and such gardens are not made by singing, oh, how beautiful, and sitting in the shade, while better men than we go out and start their working lives at grubbing weeds from gravel paths with broken dinner knives. There's not a pair of legs so thin, there's not a head so thick, there's not a hand so weak and white, nor yet a heart so sick, but it can find some needful job that's crying to be done. For the glory of the garden glorifieth every one. Then seek your job with thankfulness and work till further orders, if it's only netting strawberries or killing slugs on borders. And when your back stops aching and your hands begin to harden, you will find yourself a partner in the glory of the garden oh adam was a gardener and god who made him sees that half a proper gardener's work is done upon his knees so when your work is finished you can wash your hands and pray for the glory of the garden that it may not pass away and the glory of the garden it shall never pass away
End of The Glory of the Garden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hardy Shrubs for Forcing by William Faulkner. Coffee Break Collection 33. Gardening. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hardy Shrubs for Forcing. Shrubs for forcing should consist of early blooming kinds only. The plants should be stocky, young and healthy, well budded and well ripened, and in order to have first-class stock they should be grown expressly for forcing. For cut flowers purposes only we can lift large plants of lilacs, snowballs, dirtsias, mock oranges and the like, with all the ball of roots we can get to them and plant at once in forcing houses but this should not be done before new years we should prepare for smaller plants some months ahead of forcing time say in the preceding april or august by lifting them and planting in small pots tubs or boxes as can conveniently contain their roots and we should encourage them to root well before winter sets in keep them out of doors and plunged till after the leaves drop off then either mulch them where they are or bring them into a pit shed or cool cellar where there shall be no fear of their getting dry or of having the roots fastened in by frost introduce them into the greenhouse in succession into a cool greenhouse at first for a few weeks then as they begin to start into a warmer one from the time they are brought into the greenhouse till the flowers begin to open give a sprinkling overhead twice a day with tepid water when they have done blooming if worth keeping over for another time remove them to a cool house and thus gradually harden them off then plant them out in the garden in may and give them two years rest shrubs to be forced for their cut flowers only should consist of such kinds as have flowers that look well and keep well after being cut among these are dotsia gracilis common lilacs of various colours staphylia colchica Spirea cantonensis, Reversii, single and double, the Goulder Rose, the Japanese Snowball, and Azalea Mollis. To these may be added some of the lovely double flowering and Chinese apples, whose snowy or crimson tinted leaves and leafy twigs are very pretty. The several double flowered forms of Prunus triloba are also desirable, but a healthy stock is hard to get. Andromeda floribunda and Andromeda japonica set their flower buds the previous summer for the next year's flowers and are, therefore, like the Laurestinus, easily forced into bloom after New Year's. Hardy and half-hardy rhododendrons with very little forcing may be had in bloom from March. In addition to the above, for conservatory decoration we may introduce all manner of hardy shrubs double flowering peach and cherry trees are easily forced and showy while they last clumps of pyrus arbutifolia can easily be had in bloom in march when their abundance of deep green leaves is an additional charm to their profusion of hawthorn-like flowers the chinese xanthocerus is extremely copious and showy but of brief duration and ill-fitted for cutting Bushes of yellow broom and double-flowering golden firs can easily be had after January. Jasminum nudiflorum may be had in bloom from November till April, and Forsythia from January. They look well when trained up to pillars. The early flowering clematises may be used to capital advantage in the same way, from February onward. Although the Mahonias flower well, their foliage at blooming time is not always comely, out of doors the american redbud makes a handsomer tree than does the japanese one but the latter is preferable for greenhouse work as the flowers are bright and the smallest plants bloom the chinese wisteria blooms as well in the greenhouse as it does outside indeed if we introduce some branches of an outdoor plant into the greenhouse we can have it in bloom two months ahead of the balance of the vine still left out of doors Hereabout we grow wisterias as standards, and they bloom magnificently. What a sight a big standard wisteria in the greenhouse in February will be. Among other shrubs may be mentioned shadbush, African tamarix, 
daphne of sorts and exocordra we have also a good many barely hardy plants that may be wintered well in a cellar or cold pit and forced into bloom in early spring among these are japanese privet pittosporum raphiolepsis hydrangeas and the like and for conservatory decoration we can also use with excellent advantage some of our fine-leaved shrubs for instance our lovely japanese maples and variegated box elder glen cove end of hardy shrubs for forcing the home grounds by mrs schuyler van rensselaer coffee break collection thirty three gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Home Grounds The union, a happy marriage it should be, between the house beautiful and the ground near it, says a recent English writer, is worthy of more thought than it has had in the past, and the best ways of effecting that union artistically should interest men more and more as our cities grow larger and our lovely English landscape shrinks back from them this writer is an enthusiast for natural gardening methods so we are not surprised to find that in speaking of the ground near a country house he should say little about harmonizing it with the house itself but much about uniting it agreeably with the landscape beyond its own borders he calls this ground the garden which is its right old-fashioned name but in america at least garden is most generally understood as meaning very small grounds or an enclosure of some sort where plants are grown chiefly for the sake of their own individual beauties and so with us home grounds is a better term when we want to speak more broadly speaking then of all the grounds near the house this englishman explains that there are situations as on the hillsides of italy where the character of the spot prescribes a formal semi-artificial kind of treatment but he continues the lawn is the heart of the true english garden and as essential as the terrace is to the gardens on the steep hills and in general these words are true for america as well in fact there is less need in america than in england to protest against the making of formal gardens where naturalistic lawns with appropriate framings and backgrounds of foliage should exist it would be difficult to discover any american homes where on level ground the terrace walls cut off the view of the landscape from the house and on the other hand the house from the landscape nevertheless there are certain errors in garden design into which we are as apt to fall as the english and we should be doubly anxious to avoid them for it seems our architects are succeeding better than the english in creating that house beautiful which must be the center of the complex ultimate picture if the taste of the writer whom i quote can be trusted most of the houses built in our time in england are so bad that even the best garden could not save them from contempt while although we often build bad houses too many of our country homes are so very good that we think with a pang how much better yet they would be were their home grounds properly planned and planted how to plan and plant such grounds is a most interesting question although of course varying with each individual case it cannot be approached theoretically except in a very general way let us however suppose that a house has been advantageously placed and attractively designed that it looks out upon a beautiful landscape and that the intervening space is of such extent and character that it can be made an harmonious link between house and landscape giving the house a fitting environment when it is seen from a distance and the landscape a fitting foreground when it is seen from the house the two questions then are how to plant and what to plant as regards the former one cannot answer theoretically except by saying that there should if possible be a wide extent of lawn or lawns to give repose and unity to the picture with surrounding plantations varied in mass and skyline to enframe the lawns and connect them with the landscape 
that open outlook should be left but not too generously for the contemplation of the most beautiful parts of the background that all disagreeable objects should be carefully masked from sight and that roads and walks should be as few and inconspicuous as convenience will allow if a good landscape gardener is employed these arrangements will be planned and their preliminary portions will be executed without much trouble to the owner but in settling the question what to plant in completing them the landscape gardener in america as in england sometimes seems as much in need of guidance as the owner and even when his ideas are entirely right the owner too often interferes with their execution or adds inharmonious details of his own as the years go by our english author is partially correct when he says that most people who care for gardens still taking the word in the wide sense he gives it suppose that they are made for plants and that if a garden has any use it is to measure for us beautiful flowers trees and shrubs but this idea of a garden's function is much too narrow the home grounds form beyond question a place where beautiful plants should be fostered but they should also form an entity a composition a picture which will be beautiful as a whole and in harmony with its surroundings and however well planned such a composition such a natural picture may be shorn of beauty and rendered painfully artificial if its elements big or small are injudiciously selected our englishman's decision is that the true use and first reason of the home grounds is to keep and grow for us plants not in our woods and mostly from other countries than our own but this it seems to me is a very mistaken decision i quote it simply because so many american gardeners and amateurs consciously or instinctively adopt it and so doing usually spoil the home grounds which they are anxious to adorn the true use and first purpose of the home grounds is to grow for us beautiful plants of such a kind that their right association will make a beautiful whole beautifully in keeping with the house on the one hand and with the outer landscape on the other in fitting them for this purpose we are at liberty to get our trees shrubs and flowers where we will provided we introduce none which by a discordant note will mar that general effect which must be determined by soil situation and climate and by the character of the house and of the local landscape to be harmonious and therefore beautiful grounds over which we see the berkshire hills or the valley of the hudson must evidently be american gardens just as those in the valley of the thames must be english and those on the southern shore of france must have the mixed semi-tropical character peculiar to the mediterranean coast to secure this local character local plants are essential as a foundation and then to give variety interest and the true garden-like air and charm exotics should be mingled with them but these exotics should never be chosen for their rarity or novelty alone or even for their intrinsic beauty and still less as is too commonly the case should they be chosen for their mere conspicuousness first of all they should harmonize with the other plants about them and therefore the novice may well hesitate before dipping deeply into those stores of foreign plants which are now so vast and varied and accessible his choice will not be narrow if in addition to native plants he selects such as have come from lands with climates akin to our own in using these last he will be following nature's own example here in america she does not confine herself to growing plants which were originally american she takes up vegetable immigrants as hospitably as our civilization takes up human immigrants and assimilates them as quickly and naturally who would suspect the white willow or the barberry in new england or the parlonia in the woods of maryland to be an exotic or the field daisy which fills all our meadows and who sees anything inharmonious or strange in the aspect of the ailanthus trees which mingling with native elms shade the rustic streets of nantucket nature chooses which exotics she will grow 
for what we may call scientific reasons but the artistic effect of her results is invariably good and man should learn from her how to make a similar choice taking a wider liberty of course when he is planning a garden than when he is planning a forest but never forgetting that in gardens such as we have now in mind he should grow together only such plants as will look well together there are exotic flowers which look as natural as appropriate in a garden as the marguerite of europe looks in our fields but there are others which seem entirely out of place as parts of an american garden if it has any design any character at all i do not mean to disparage the cultivation of rare or novel or conspicuous plants whether native or exotic it is a delightful task to collect plants for their own sakes without any reference to their relation with the surrounding scenery but collections should be arranged on spots specially set apart for them where they will not injure the main picture formed by the general environment of the house and the encircling landscape as regards the grounds the garden in its wider sense they will assuredly be most beautiful interesting and enjoyable when both native and foreign plants have been used in tasteful combination but if confined to one of these classes it would be much worse to choose plants not in our woods and fields and mostly from countries not our own than to choose our own using native plants alone one would miss a thousand chances to secure a delightful variety but using the others alone there would be the certainty of an inharmonious whole a garden filled with beautiful plants which would not be a beautiful garden or an appropriate environment for the house or a suitable foreground for the outer landscape of american forest hill and stream i do not know that i should say so confidently that a planter may be very chary in his use of exotic plants or even dispense with them altogether were i writing in england our country is incomparably richer in forms of vegetation than is any european land and especially in those larger forms which are the planter's chief reliance when he works on an extensive scale to say this we need not match our whole big fatherland against a smaller european one or even against the whole of europe when the first explorers landed when no seeds had been sown here but those of nature's sowing these atlantic and middle states would have seemed very rich if matched against all of europe were the englishman of today confined to his woods and fields deprived of what ours have sent him he would be poor indeed but did we appreciate the half of our treasury we should see how little we really need europe or asia or africa to help us to furnish forth our works of landscape art yet although we do not actually need them their help is very welcome if we take it in proper fashion we should add other things to ours without overwhelming ours and thus selling our birthright of individuality for what alas too often proves a mess of motley herbage and we should call upon europe and eastern asia akin in climate to our eastern america rather than upon the tropics and those other lands where vegetable types have developed in harmony with natural conditions that are not our own we want american gardens american landscapes american parks and pleasure grounds not the features of those of a dozen different countries huddled together into a scene which has no simplicity harmony or unity and therefore no character no likeness to nature and therefore no artistic work end of the home grounds how to make a lawn by w j beale coffee break collection thirty three gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org how to make a lawn Quote, a smooth closely shaven surface of grass is by far the most essential element of beauty on the grounds of a suburban home End quote. this is the language of mr f j scott and it is equally true of other than suburban grounds a good lawn then is worth working for 
and if it have a substantial foundation it will endure for generations and improve with age we take it for granted that the drainage is thorough for no one would build a dwelling on water-soaked land no labour should be spared in making the soil deep rich and fine in the full import of the words as this is the stock from which future dividends of joy and satisfaction are to be drawn before grading one should read the chapter of downings on the beauty in ground this will warn against terracing or levelling the whole surface and ensure a contour with gentle curves and undulations which is essential to the best effects if the novice has read much of the conflicting advice in books and catalogues he is probably in a state of bewilderment as to the kind of seed to sow and when that point is settled it is really a difficult task to secure pure and living seeds of just such species as one orders rarely does either seller or buyer know the grasses called for especially the finer and rarer sorts and more rarely still does either know their seeds the only safe way is to have the seeds tested by an expert mr j b olcott in a racy article in the report of the connecticut board of agriculture for eighteen eighty six says fifteen years ago nice people were often sowing timothy red top and clover for dooryards and failing wretchedly with lawn making while seedsmen and gardeners even disputed the identity of our june grass and kentucky blue grass we have passed beyond that stage of ignorance however and to the question what shall we sow mr olcott replies rhode island bent and kentucky blue grass are their foolish trade names for they belong no more to kentucky or rhode island than to other northern states two sorts of fine agrostis are honestly sold under the trade name of rhode island bent and as trade goes we may consider ourselves lucky if we get even the coarser one the finest a little the finest agrostis canina is a rather rare valuable and elegant grass which should be much better known by grass farmers as well as gardeners than it is these are both good lawn as well as pasture grasses the grass usually sold as road island bent is agrostis vulgaris the smaller red top of the east and of europe this makes an excellent lawn agrostis canina has a short slender projecting awn from one of the glooms agrostis vulgaris lacks his projecting awn in neither case have we in mind what michigan and new york people call red top this is a tall coarse native grass often quite abundant on low lands botanically agrostis alba so small red top or rhode island bent and june grass kentucky blue grass if you prefer that name poa pratensis if in the chaff so in any proportion you fancy and in any quantity up to four bushels per acre if evenly sown less will answer but the thicker it is sown the sooner the ground will be covered with fine green grass we can add nothing else that will improve this mixture and either alone is about as good as both a little white clover or sweet vernal grass of sheep's fescue may be added if you fancy them but they will not improve the appearance of the lawn roll the ground after seeding sow the seeds in september or in march or april and under no circumstance yield to the advice to sow a little oats or rye to protect the young grass instead of protecting they will rob the slender grasses of what they most need now wait a little do not be discouraged if some ugly weeds get the start of the numerous green hairs which slowly follow as soon as there is anything to be cut of weeds or grass mow closely and mow often so that nothing need be raked from the ground as olcott puts it quote, leave one crop where it belongs for home consumption the rains will wash the soluble substance of the wilted grass into the earth to feed the growing roots End quote. during succeeding summers as the years roll on the lawn should be perpetually enriched by the leaching of the short leaves as they are often mown neither leave a very short growth nor a very heavy growth for winter experience alone must guide the owner if cut too closely some of it may be killed or start too late in the spring if left too high during winter the dead long grass will be hard to cut in spring and leave the stubble unsightly after passing through one winter 
the annual weeds will have perished and leave the grass to take the lead perennial weeds should be faithfully dug out or destroyed in some way every year add a top dressing of some commercial fertilizer or a little finely pulverized compost which may be brushed in no one will disfigure his front yard with coarse manure spread on the lawn for five months of the year if well made a lawn will be a perpetual delight as long as a proprietor lives but if the soil is thin and poor or if the coarser grasses and clovers are sown instead of those named he will be much perplexed and will very likely try some expensive experiments and at last plough up properly fit the land and begin over again this will make the cost and annoyance much greater than at first because the trees and shrubs have already filled many portions of the soil a small piece well made and well kept will give more satisfaction than a larger plot of inferior turf end of how to make a lawn the july garden by robert ernest vernade coffee break collection thirty three gardening recording by sonia the july garden it's july in my garden and steel blue are the globe thistles and french grey the willows that bow to every breeze and deep in every currant bush a robber blackbird whistles i'm picking i'm picking i'm picking these so off i go to rout them and find instead i'm gazing at clusters of delphiniums the seed was small and brown but these are spurs that fell from heaven and caught the most amazing colours of the welkin's own as they came hustling down and then some roses catch my eye or maybe some sweet williams or pink and white and purple peals of canterbury bells or pencilled violas that keep between the three leaf trilliums or red-hot pokers all aglow or poppies that cast spells and while i stare at each in turn i quite forget or pardon the blackbirds and the blackguards that keep robbing me of pie for what do such things matter when i have so fair a garden and what is half so lovely as my garden in july end of the july garden this librivox recording is in the public domain q gardens by virginia woolf coffee break collection thirty three gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org q gardens from the oval shaped flower bed there rose perhaps a hundred stalks spreading into heart shaped or tongue shaped leaves half way up and unfurling at the tip red or blue or yellow petals marked with spots of colour raised upon the surface and from the red blue or yellow gloom of the throat emerged a straight bar rough with gold dust and slightly clubbed at the end the petals were voluminous enough to be stirred by the summer breeze and when they moved the red blue and yellow lights passed one over the other staining an inch of the brown earth beneath with a spot of the most intricate colour the light fell either upon the smooth grey back of a pebble or the shell of a snail with its brown circular veins or falling into a raindrop it expanded with such intensity of red blue and yellow the thin walls of water that one expected them to burst and disappear instead the drop was left in a second silver grey once more and the light now settled upon the flesh of a leaf revealing the branching thread of fibre beneath the surface and again it moved on and spread its illumination in the vast green spaces beneath the dome of the heart-shaped and tongue-shaped leaves then the breeze stirred rather more briskly overhead and the colour was flashed into the air above into the eyes of the men and women who walked in kew gardens in july the figures of these men and women straggled past the flower-bed with a curiously irregular movement not unlike that of the white and blue butterflies who crossed the turf in zigzag flights from bed to bed the man was about six inches in front of the woman strolling carelessly while she bore on with greater purpose only turning her head now and then to see that the children were not too far behind the man kept his distance in front of the woman purposely though perhaps unconsciously for he wished to go on with his thoughts fifteen years ago i came here with lily he thought we sat somewhere over there by a lake and i begged her to marry me all through the hot afternoon 
how the dragonfly kept circling round us. How clearly I see the dragonfly and her shoe with the square silver buckle at the toe. All the time I spoke, I saw her shoe, and when it moved impatiently, I knew without looking up what she was going to say. The whole of her seemed to be in her shoe. And my love, my desire, were in the dragonfly. For some reason, I thought that if it settled there, on that leaf, the broad one with the red flower in the middle of it, if the dragonfly settled on the leaf, she would say, yes, at once. But the dragonfly went round and round. It never settled anywhere. Of course not, happily not, or I shouldn't be walking here with Eleanor and the children. Tell me, Eleanor, do you ever think of the past? Why do you ask, Simon? Because I've been thinking of the past. I've been thinking of Lily, the woman I might have married. Well, why are you silent? Do you mind my thinking of the past? Why should I mind, Simon? Doesn't one always think of the past? In a garden, with men and women lying under the trees, aren't they one's past, all that remains of it? Those men and women, those ghosts lying under the trees, one's happiness, one's reality? For me, a square silver shoe buckle and a dragonfly. For me, a kiss. Imagine six little girls sitting before their easels twenty years ago, down by the side of a lake, painting the water lilies, the first red water lilies I'd ever seen. And suddenly a kiss, there on the back of my neck, and my hand shook all the afternoon so that I couldn't paint. I took out my watch and marked the hour when I would allow myself to think of the kiss for five minutes only. It was so precious, the kiss of an old grey-haired woman with a wart on her nose, the mother of all my kisses all my life. Come, Caroline, come, Hubert. They walked on past the flower bed, now walking four abreast, and soon diminished in size among the trees and looked half transparent as the sunlight and shade swam over their backs in large, trembling, irregular patches. In the oval flower bed, the snail, whose shell had been stained red, blue, and yellow for the space of two minutes or so, now appeared to be moving very slightly in its shell and next began to labour over the crumbs of loose earth which broke away and rolled down as it passed over them. It appeared to have a definite goal in front of it, differing in this respect from the singular high-stepping angular green insect who attempted to cross in front of it, and waited for a second with its antennae trembling as if in deliberation, and then stepped off as rapidly and strangely in the opposite direction. Brown cliffs with deep green lakes in the hollows, flat, blade-like trees that waved from root to tip, round boulders of grey stone, vast, crumpled surfaces of a thin, crackling texture. All these objects lay across the snail's progress between one stalk and another to his goal. Before he had decided whether to circumvent the arched tent of a dead leaf or to breast it, there came past the bed the feet of other human beings. This time they were both men. The younger of the two wore an expression of perhaps unnatural calm. He raised his eyes and fixed them very steadily in front of him while his companion spoke, and directly his companion had done speaking, he looked on the ground again, and sometimes opened his lips only after a long pause, and sometimes did not open them at all. The elder man had a curiously uneven and shaky method of walking, jerking his hand forward and throwing up his head abruptly, rather in the manner of an impatient carriage horse tired of waiting outside a house. But in the man, these gestures were irresolute and pointless. He talked almost incessantly. He smiled to himself and again began to talk, as if the smile had been an answer. He was talking about spirits, the spirits of the dead, who, according to him, were even now telling him all sorts of odd things about their experiences in heaven. Heaven was known to the ancients as Thessaly, William, and now, with this war, the spirit matter is rolling between the hills like thunder. He paused, seemed to listen, smiled, jerked his head and continued, You have a small electric battery and a piece of rubber to insulate the wire. Isolate? Insulate? Well, we'll skip the details, no good going into details that wouldn't be understood, and in short... The little machine stands in any convenient position by the head of the bed, we will say, on a neat mahogany stand. All arrangements being properly fixed by workmen under my direction, the widow applies her ear and summons the spirit by signs as agreed. Woman! Widows! Woman in black! Here he seemed to have caught sight of a woman's dress in the distance, which in the shade looked a purple black. He took off his hat, 
placed his hand upon his heart and hurried towards her muttering and gesticulating feverishly but william caught him by the sleeve and touched a flower with the tip of his walking-stick in order to divert the old man's attention after looking at it for a moment in some confusion the old man bent his ear to it and seemed to answer a voice speaking from it for he began talking about the forests of uruguay which he had visited hundreds of years ago in company with the most beautiful young woman in europe he could be heard murmuring about forests of uruguay blanketed with the wax petals of tropical roses nightingales sea beaches mermaids and women drowned at sea as he suffered himself to be moved on by william upon whose face the look of stoical patience grew slowly deeper and deeper following his steps so closely as to be slightly puzzled by his gestures came two elderly women of the lower middle class one stout and ponderous the other rosy-cheeked and nimble like most women of their station they were frankly fascinated by any signs of eccentricity betokening a disordered brain especially in the well-to-do but they were too far off to be certain whether the gestures were merely eccentric or genuinely mad after they had scrutinized the old man's back in silence for a moment and given each other a queer sly look they went on energetically piecing together their very complicated dialogue nell bert loss cess phil pa he says i says she says i says i says i says my bert sis bill grandad the old man sugar sugar flower kippers greens sugar 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 the ponderous woman looked through the pattern of falling words at the flowers standing cool firm and upright in the earth with a curious expression she saw them as a sleeper waking from a heavy sleep sees a brass candlestick reflecting the light in an unfamiliar way and closes his eyes and opens them and seeing the brass candlestick again finally starts broad awake and stares at the candlestick with all his powers so the heavy woman came to a standstill opposite the oval-shaped flower-bed and ceased even to pretend to listen to what the other woman was saying she stood there letting the words fall over her swaying the top part of her body slowly backwards and forwards looking at the flowers then she suggested that they should find a seat and have their tea the snail had now considered every possible method of reaching his goal without going round the dead leaf or climbing over it let alone the effort needed for climbing a leaf he was doubtful whether the thin texture which vibrated with such an alarming crackle when touched even by the tip of his horns would bear his weight and this determined him finally to creep beneath it for there was a point where the leaf curved high enough from the ground to admit him he had just inserted his head in the opening and was taking stock of the high brown roof and was getting used to the cool brown light when two other people came past outside on the turf this time they were both young a young man and a young woman they were both in the prime of youth or even in that season which precedes the prime of youth the season before the smooth pink folds of the flower have burst their gummy case when the wings of the butterfly though fully grown are motionless in the sun lucky it isn't friday he observed why do you believe in luck they make you pay sixpence on friday what sixpence anyway isn't it worth sixpence what's it what do you mean by it oh anything i mean you know what i mean long pauses came between each of these remarks they were uttered in toneless and monotonous voices the couple stood still on the edge of the flower-bed and together pressed the end of her parasol deep down into the soft earth the action and the fact that his hand rested on the top of hers expressed their feelings in a strange way as these short insignificant words also expressed something words with short wings for their heavy body of meaning inadequate to carry them far and thus alighting awkwardly upon the very common objects that surrounded them and were to their inexperienced touch so massive but who knows so they thought as they pressed the parasol into the earth what precipices aren't concealed in them or what slopes of ice don't shine in the sun on the other side who knows who has ever seen this before even when she wondered what sort of tea they gave you at kew he felt that something loomed up behind her words and stood vast and solid behind them and the mist very slowly rose and uncovered oh heavens what were those shapes little white tables and waitresses who looked first at her and then at him and there was a bill that he would pay with a real two shilling piece and it was real all real he assured himself fingering the coin in his pockets real to everyone except to him and to her 
even to him it began to seem real and then but it was too exciting to stand and think any longer and he pulled the parasol out of the earth with a jerk and was impatient to find the place where one had tea with other people like other people come along tissy it's time we had our tea wherever does one have one's tea she asked with the oddest thrill of excitement in her voice looking vaguely round and letting herself be drawn on down the grass path trailing her parasol turning her head this way and that way forgetting her tea wishing to go down there and then down there remembering orchids and cranes among wild flowers a chinese pagoda and a crimson crested bird but he bore her on thus one couple after another with much the same irregular and aimless movement passed the flower-bed and were enveloped in layer after layer of green-blue vapour in which at first their bodies had substance and a dash of colour but later both substance and colour dissolved in the green-blue atmosphere how hot it was so hot that even the thrush chose to hop like a mechanical bird in the shadow of the flowers with long pauses between one movement and the next instead of rambling vaguely the white butterflies danced one above another making with their white shifting flakes the outline of a shattered marble column above the tallest flowers the glass roofs of the palm-house shone as if a whole market full of shiny green umbrellas had opened in the sun and in the drone of the aeroplane the voice of the summer sky murmured its fierce soul yellow and black pink and snow-white shapes of all these colours men women and children were spotted for a second upon the horizon and then seeing the breadth of yellow that lay upon the grass they wavered and sought shade beneath the trees dissolving like drops of water in the yellow and green atmosphere staining it faintly with red and blue it seemed as if all gross and heavy bodies had sunk down in the heat motionless and lay huddled upon the ground but their voices went wavering from them as if they were flames lolling from the thick waxen bodies of candles voices yes voices wordless voices breaking the silence suddenly with such depth of contentment such passion of desire or in the voices of children such freshness of surprise breaking the silence but there was no silence all the time the motor omnibuses were turning their wheels and changing their gear like a vast nest of chinese boxes all of wrought steel turning ceaselessly one within another the city murmured on the top of which the voices cried aloud and the petals of myriads of flowers flashed their colours into the air end of q gardens recording by rachel may ferryman meditations upon a garden by john flavel coffee break collection thirty three gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org meditations upon a garden by john flavel meditation one upon the new modelling of a garden a gentlewoman who had lately seen a neat and curious garden returns to her own with a greater dislike of it than ever resolves to new model the whole plat and reduce it to a better form she is now become so curious and neat that not a weed or stone is suffered in it but all must lie in exquisite order and whatever ornament she had observed in her neighbours she is now restless till she sees it in her own happy were it thought i if in an holy emulation every one would thus endeavour to rectify the disorders of their own conversation by the excellent graces they behold in the more heavenly and regular lives of others some christians there are i wish their number were greater whose actions lie in such a comely and beautiful order that few of their neighbours can look upon their examples without self-conviction and shame but few are so happy to be provoked into self-reformation by such rare patterns i see it is much easier to pull up many weeds out of a garden than one corruption out of the heart and to procure an hundred flowers to adorn a knot than one grace to beautify the soul it is more natural to corrupt man to envy than to imitate the spiritual excellencies of others meditation two upon the pulling up of a leek a white head and a green tail how well doth this resemble an old wanton lover whose green youthful lusts are not extinguished though his white head declares that nature is almost so grey hairs should be always matched with grave deportments and the sins of youth should rather be the griefs than pleasures of old age 
it is sad when the sins of the soul like the diseases of the body grow stronger as nature grows weaker and it recalls to my mind that ancient observation of meander it is the worst of evils to behold strong youthful lusts to rage in one that's old it is a thousand pities that those who have one foot in the grave should live as if the other were in hell that their lusts should be so lively when their bodies are three parts dead such sinful practices bring upon them more contempt and shame than their hoary heads and reverend faces can procure them honour grey hairs and aged wrinkles did of old procure more reverence than bags of gold but alas how little respect or reverence can the hoary head obtain amongst wise men except it be found in the way of righteousness i think the lowest esteem is too much for an old servant of the devil and the highest honour little enough for an ancient and faithful servant of christ meditation three upon a heedless tread in a curious garden passing through the small division of a curious knot which was richly adorned with rare tulips and other beautiful flowers i was very careful to shun these flowers which indeed had no other worth to commend them but their exquisite colour and unadvisedly trod upon and spoiled an excellent choice herb which though it grew obscurely yet had rare physical virtues in it when i was made sensible of the involuntary trespass i had committed i thought i could scarcely make the owner a better compensation than by telling him that herein though against my will i did but tread in the footsteps of the greatest part of the world who are very careful as i was to keep their due distance from splendid though worthless gallants meanwhile trampling upon and crushing under foot the obscure but most precious servants of god in the world as little do they heed these most excellent persons as i did this precious herb summa ingenia in occulto soepe latent saith plautus rare wits and herbs sometimes do skulk and shrink in such blind holes as one would little think for my own part i desire to tread upon no man with the foot of contempt and pride much less upon any good man and that i may not it concerns me to look before i step i mean to consider before i censure had i done so by this rare herb i had never hurt it meditation four upon a withered posy taken up in the way finding in my walk a posy of once sweet and fragrant but now dry and withered flowers which i supposed to be thrown away by one that had formerly worn it thus said i doth the unfaithful world use its friends when providence hath blasted and withered them whilst they are rich and honourable they will put them into their bosoms as the owner of this posy did whilst it was fresh and fragrant and as easily throw them away as useless and worthless things when thus they come to be withered such usage as this petronius long since complained of are they in honour then we smile like friends and with their fortunes all our friendship ends but this loose and deceitful friend stinks so odiously in the very nostrils of nature that a heathen poet severely taxes and condemns it as most unworthy of a man tis base to change with fortune and deny a faithful friend because in poverty and is this indeed the friendship of the world doth it thus use them whom it once honoured then lord let me never seek its friendship o let me esteem the smiles and honours of men less and thy love and favour more thy love is indeed unchangeable being pure free and built upon nothing that is mutable thou never servest thy friends as the world doth its darlings meditation five upon the sudden withering of a rose being with my friend in a garden we gathered each of us a rose he handled his tenderly smelled to it but seldom and sparingly i always kept it to my nose or squeezed it in my hand whereby in a very short time it lost both colour and sweetness but his still remained as sweet and fragrant as if it had been growing upon its own root these roses said i are the true emblems of the best and sweetest creature enjoyments in the world which being moderately and cautiously used and enjoyed may for a long time yield sweetness to the possessor of them but if once the affection seize too greedily upon them and squeeze them too hard they quickly wither in our hands and we lose the comfort of them and that either through the soul's surfeiting upon them or the lord's righteous and just removal of them because of the excess of our affections to them earthly comforts like pictures show best at a due distance 
it was therefore a good saying of homer anxi zinodoko etc i like him not who at the rate of all his might doth love or hate it is a point of excellent wisdom to keep the golden bridle of moderation upon all the affections we exercise upon earthly things and never to slip those reins unless when they move towards god in whose love there is no danger of excess meditation six upon the sudden withering of beautiful flowers how fresh and orient did these flowers lately appear when being dashed over with the morning dew they stood in all their pride and glory breathing out their delicious odours which perfume the air round about them but now are withered and shrivelled up and have neither any desirable beauty or savour in them so vain a thing is the admired beauty of creatures which so captivates the hearts and exercises a pleasing tyranny over the affections of vain man yet it is as suddenly blasted as the beauty of a flower how frail is beauty in how short a time it fades like roses which have passed their prime so wrinkled age the fairest face will plough and cast deep furrows on the smoothest brow then where's that lovely tempting face alas yourselves would blush to view it in a glass if then thou delightest in beauty o my soul choose that which is lasting there is a beauty which never fades even the beauty of holiness upon the inner man this abides fresh and orient for ever and sparkles gloriously when thy face the seat of natural beauty is become an abhorrent and loathsome spectacle holiness enamels and sprinkles over the face of the soul with a beauty upon which christ himself is enamoured even imperfect holiness on earth is a rose that breathes sweetly in the bud in heaven it will be full-blown and abide in its prime to all eternity meditation seven upon the tenderness of some choice flowers how much care is necessary to preserve the life of some flowers they must be boxed up in the winter others must be covered with glasses in their springing up the finest and richest mould must be sifted about the roots and assiduously watered and all this little enough and sometimes too little to preserve them whilst other common and worthless flowers grow without any help of ours yea we have no less to do to rid our gardens of them than we have to make the former grow there thus stands the case with our hearts in reference to the motions of grace and sin holy thoughts of god must be assiduously watered by prayer earthed up by meditation and defended by watchfulness and yet all this is sometimes too little to preserve them alive in our souls alas the heart is a soil that agrees not with them they are tender things and a small matter will nip and kill them to this purpose is the complaint of the divine poet who could have thought a joy so coy to be offended so and go so suddenly away hereafter i had need take heed joys among other things have wings and watch their opportunities of flight converting in a moment day to night herbert but vain thoughts and unholy suggestions these spread themselves and root deep in the heart they naturally agree with the soil so that it is almost impossible at any time to be rid of them it is hard to forget what is our sin to remember meditation eight upon the strange means of preserving the life of vegetables i observe that plants and herbs are sometimes killed by frosts and yet without frosts they would neither live nor thrive they are sometimes drowned with water and yet without water they cannot subsist they are refreshed and cheered by the heat of the sun and yet that sun sometimes kills and scorches them up thus lives my soul troubles and afflictions seem to kill all its comforts and yet without these its comforts could not live the sun-blasts of prosperity sometimes refresh me and yet those sun-blasts are the likeliest way to wither me by what seeming contradictions is this life of my spirit preserved what a mystery what a paradox is the life of a christian welcome my health this sickness makes me well medicines are new when with diseases i have list to dwell i'll wish for you welcome my strength this weakness makes me able powers are due when i am weary grown of standing stable i'll wish for you welcome my wealth this loss hath gained me more riches are due when i again grow greedy to be poor i'll wish for you welcome my credit this disgrace is glory honours are due when for renown and fame i shall be sorry i will wish for you welcome content this sorrow is my joy pleasures are due 
when I desire such griefs as may annoy, I will wish for you. Health, strength, and riches, credit, and content, are spared best sometimes when they are spent. Sickness and weakness, loss, disgrace, and sorrow, lend most sometimes when most they seem to borrow. And if by these contrary and improbable ways the Lord preserves our souls in life, no marvel, then, we find such strange and seemingly contradictory motions of our hearts under the various dealings of God with us, and are still restless in what condition soever he puts us, which restless frame was excellently expressed in that pious epigram of the Reverend Gattaca, made a little before his death. I thirst for thirstiness, I weep for tears. Well pleased I am to be displeased thus. The only thing I fear is want of fears, suspecting I am not suspicious. I cannot choose but live, because I die, and when I am not dead, how glad am I! Yet when I am thus glad for sense of pain, and careful am, lest I should careless be, then do I grieve for being glad again, and fear, lest carefulness take care for me. Amidst these restless thoughts this rest I find, for those that rest not here, there's rest behind. Jam te tigi portum valete End of Meditations Upon a Garden An Old Fashioned Garden by Julia C. R. Dorr Coffee Break Collection 33 Gardening Recording by Sonia An Old Fashioned Garden An Old Fashioned Garden? Yes, my dear, no doubt it is. I was thinking here only today, as I sat in the sun, how fair was the scene I looked upon, yet wondered still with a vague surprise how it might look to other eyes tis a wide old garden not a bed cut here and there in the turf instead the broad straight paths run east and west down which two horsemen could ride abreast and north and south with an equal state from the grey stone wall to the low white gate and where they cross on the middle line virgin's bower and wild woodbine clamber and climb at their own sweet will over the latticed arbor still though since they were planted years have flown and many a time have the roses blown to the right the hill runs down to the river where the willows droop and the aspens shiver and under the shade of the hemlock trees the low ferns nod to the passing breeze there wild flowers blossom and mosses creep with a tangle of vines over the wooded steep so quiet it is so cool and still in the green retreat of the shady hill and you scarce can tell as you look within where the garden ends and the woods begin but here where we stand what a blaze of light what a wealth of colour makes glad the sight red roses burn in the morning glow white roses proffer their cups of snow in scarlet and crimson and cloth of gold the zinnias flaunt and the marigold and stately and tall the lilies stand like vestal virgins on either hand here gay sweet peas like butterflies flutter and dance under summer skies blue violets here in the shade are set with a border of fragrant mignonette and here are pansies and columbine and the burning stars of the cypress vine stately hollyhocks row on row golden sunflowers all aglow scarlet poppies and larkspurs blue asters of every shade and hue and over the wall like a trail of fire the red nasturtium climbs higher and higher my lady's slippers are fair to see and her pinks are as sweet as sweet can be with gillyflowers and morning brides and many another flower besides do you see that rose without a thorn it was planted the year my hell was born and he is a man now yes my dear an old-fashioned garden but sitting here i think how often lover and maid down these long flowery paths have strayed and how little feet have over them run that will stir no more in shade or sun as one who reads from an open book on these fair luminous scrolls i look and all the story of life is there its loves and losses hope and despair an old-fashioned garden but to my eyes fair as the hills 
of paradise end of an old-fashioned garden this librivox recording is in the public domain our experience in crops by harriet beecher stowe published in eighteen seventy three in her collected stories palmetto leaves about tourism and settling in florida this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org our experience in crops a few years ago three brothers farmers from vermont exhausted by the long hard winters there came to florida to try an experiment they bought two hundred and seventy-five acres in the vicinity of mandarin at one dollar per acre it was pine land that had been cut over twice for timber and was now considered of no further value by its possessor who threw it into the hands of a land agent to make what he could of it it was the very cheapest kind of florida land of this land they cleared only thirty-five acres the fencing cost two hundred dollars they put up a large unplastered two-story house with piazzas on both floors at a cost of about a thousand dollars the additional outlay was on two mules and a pair of oxen estimated at four hundred dollars the last year they put up a sugar mill and establishment at a cost of five hundred dollars an orange grove a vineyard and a peach orchard are all included in the program of these operators and are all well under way but these are later results it is not safe to calculate on an orange grove under ten years or on a vineyard or peach orchard under four or five we have permission to copy verbatim certain memoranda of results with which they have furnished us cabbages first year sowed seed in light sandy soil without manure weak plants beaten down by rain lost second year put out an acre and a half of fine plants large part turned out poorly part of the land was low sour and wet and all meagerly fertilized crops sold in jacksonville for two hundred and fifty dollars third year three acres better but still inadequately manured and half ruined by the christmas frost brought about eight hundred dollars fourth year eighteen seventy one through seventy two two acres better manured planted in low land on ridges five feet apart returned six hundred dollars in favorable seasons with good culture an acre of cabbages should yield a gross return of five hundred dollars of which three hundred would be clear profit cucumbers first year planted four acres mostly new hard sour land broadcasting fifty bushels of lime to the acre and using some weak half-rotted compost in the hills wretched crop the whole lot sent north did not pay for shipment second year an acre and a half best land heavily manured with well-rotted compost worked in different drills eight feet apart yielded fifty bushels which brought two hundred and fifty dollars in new york more would have been realized except that an untimely hailstorm spoiled the vines prematurely third year an acre and a half well cultivated and manured yielded four hundred bushels and brought a gross return of thirteen hundred dollars tomatoes first year lost many plants through rain and wet and insufficient manure those we got to the new york market brought from four to six dollars per bushel second year manured too heavily in the hill with powerful unfermented manures a heavy rain helped ruin the crop those however which we sent to market brought good prices third year none planted for market but those for family use did so well as to put us in a good humor with the crop and induce us to plant for this year sweet potatoes every year we have had pretty good success with them on land well prepared with lime and ashes we have had three hundred and fifty bushels to the acre sugar cane has done very respectably on one year old soil manured with ashes only while mellow land well prepared with muck ashes and fish guano has yielded about twenty barrels of sugar to the acre irish potatoes 
we have found these on light soil with only moderate fertilizing an unprofitable crop at four dollars but on good land with very heavy manuring decidedly profitable at two dollars per bushel fine potatoes rarely are less than that in jacksonville they will be ready to dig in april and may peas may be extraordinarily profitable and may fail entirely a mild winter without severe frosts would bring them early into market the christmas freeze of eighteen seventy caught a half acre of our peas in blossom and killed them to the ground planted in the latter part of january both peas and potatoes are pretty sure we have done not much with peas but a neighbor of ours prefers them to cabbages he gets about three dollars per bushel as a general summary our friend adds quote, for two years in succession we have found our leading market crops handsomely remunerative the net returns look well compared with those of successful gardening near new york cabbages raised here during the fall and winter without any protection bear as good price as do the spring cabbages which are raised in cold frames at the north and early cucumbers grown in the open air have been worth as much to us as northern gardeners who have grown them in hotbeds the secret of our success is an open one but we ourselves do not yet come up to our mark and reduce our preaching to practice we have hardly made a good beginning in high manuring we did not understand at first as we do now the difference between ordinary crops and early vegetables and fruit good corn may be raised on poor land at the rate of five to ten bushels an acre but on a hundred acres of scantily fertilized land scarcely a single handsome cabbage can be grown so with cucumbers they will neither be early nor fit for market if raised on ordinary land with ordinary culture most of the market gardening in florida so far as we know it cannot but prove disastrous land agents and visionaries hold forth that great crops may be expected from insignificant outlays and so they decoy the credulous to their ruin to undertake raising vegetables in florida with these ideas of low culture is to embark in a leaky and surely sinking ship if one is unwilling to expend for manure alone upon a single acre in one year enough to buy a hundred acres of new land let him give a wide berth to market gardening such expenditures have to be met at the north and there is no getting round it at the south yet one can economize here as one cannot in the north the whole culture of an early vegetable garden can go on in connection with the later crop of sugar-cane before our cabbages were off the ground this spring we had our cane rows between them and we never before prepared the ground and planted the cane so easily on another field we have the cane rows eight feet apart the tomatoes and snap beans intervening we have suffered much for lack of proper drainage we have actually lost enough from water standing upon crops to have underdrained the whole enclosure we undertook to till more acres than we could do justice to in farming the love of acres is the root of all evil End quote so much for our friends experiences we consider this experiment a most valuable one for all who contemplate buying land and settling in florida it is an experiment in which untiring industry patience and economy have been brought into exercise it has been tried on the very cheapest land in florida and its results are most instructive market gardening must be the immediate source of support and therefore this experiment is exactly the point this will show that the land is the least of the expense in starting a farm and that it is best in the first instance to spend little for land and much for the culture of it thousands of people pour down into florida to winter and must be fed the jacksonville market and the markets of all the different boarding establishments on the river need ample supplies and there is no fear that there will not be a ready sale for all that could be raised our friends are willing to make a free contribution of their own failures and mistakes for the good of those who come after it shows that a new country must be studied and tried before success is attained newcomers by settling in the vicinity of successful planters may shorten the painful paths of experience 
all which we commend to all those who have written to inquire about buying land in florida end of our experience in crops by harriet beecher stowe read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in august two thousand twenty one planning the garden from the war gardens by montagu free coffee break collection thirty three gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ahana malik planning the garden a garden can be made without a plan but it is usually a haphazard sort of affair and it frequently means that much more money is spent for seeds than is necessary another frequent happening in a miss or hit garden of this kind is a plethora of some kinds of vegetables and a great scarcity of others it is difficult to give any definite information as to the quantities of vegetables to grow as yields vary so much owing to the character of the soil and climate the variety of the vegetable and the skill or lack of it of the gardener the preferences of the individual must also be considered the table in the appendix giving the approximate amount of vegetables that can be obtained from a hundred foot row may be helpful it must be remembered however that these figures are only approximate and that wide variations can be expected when planning your garden you must take into consideration the sunshine it receives and if part of it is shaded reserve that part for those crops that will endure shade if there is any variation in the nature of the soil whether in regard to its physical condition fertility or wetness you should place the crops accordingly as a general rule the rows should run north and south as by this plan each row receives its share of sunlight if for any reason this is not practicable put the tall growing crops at the north end of the plot so that they do not shade the smaller kinds the perennial crops like asparagus and rhubarb are best placed at one end or side of the plot so that they are not in the way when digging or ploughing is being done it makes a better looking plot if those vegetables which are planted the same distance apart are grouped together plan to have the ground occupied for the whole season many vegetables take a comparatively short time in which to mature and these can be removed when harvested and the ground occupied by another crop thus peas can be followed by cauliflower or cabbage early beets by beans lettuce by tomato and so on find out the average number of growing days in your locality and consult the table in the appendix giving the number of days required to bring the various crops to maturity when planning for succession vegetables have some regard to crop rotation that is to say if the ground in the early part of the season has been occupied by a leaf crop follow it by a fruit crop or vice versa early cabbage followed by beans may be cited as an example similarly root crops may be followed by leaf crops as early carrots and fall spinach another important reason for crop rotation is that it lessens the danger of loss from disease many of the fungus diseases of plants are carried over from year to year in the soil some of them are able to live on only one particular host plant and if that crop is not grown in the soil where the fungus is hibernating the disease ultimately dies out through lack of food the first thing to do in planning a vegetable garden is to measure the plot and transfer its outlines to scale on paper then bearing in mind the considerations just outlined in this chapter decide on the kinds of vegetables you wish to grow now the real fun of planning begins the desires of the grower as to quantities and variety of vegetables must be scaled down so as to fit the plot 
Take a ruler and draw lines across your plan to represent the rows of vegetables. The distance between the rows may be drawn to scale to correspond with the actual distance between the rows on the ground, or you may merely note the theoretical distance between the lines. Write the name of the vegetable on each line with that of the succession crop, if any. It is a good idea to mount your plan on stiff cardboard when finished and to allow a space either at the side or on the back for making notes to be taken during the growing season. These notes may consist of reminders that such and such a crop is not suited in its present location, the time occupied from seed sowing to maturity, the desirability or otherwise of certain vegetables, etc. End of Planning the Garden The Point of View by L. H. Bailey Coffee Break Collection 33 Gardening This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Point of View Wherever there is soil, plants grow and produce their kind, and all plants are interesting. When a person makes a choice as to what plants he shall grow in any given place, he becomes a gardener or a farmer, and if the conditions are such that he cannot make a choice, he may adopt the plants that grow there by nature, and by making the most of them may still be a gardener or a farmer in some degree. Every family, therefore, may have a garden, if there is not a foot of land, there are porches or windows. Wherever there is sunlight, plants may be made to grow. And one plant in a tin can may be a more helpful and inspiring garden to some mind than a whole acre of lawn and flowers may be to another. The satisfaction of a garden does not depend on the area, nor happily on the cost or rarity of the plants. It depends on the temper of the person. One must first seek to love plants and nature, and then to cultivate the happy peace of mind that is satisfied with little. In the vast majority of cases, a person will be happier if he has no rigid and arbitrary notions, for gardens are moodish, particularly with the novice. If plants grow and thrive, he should be happy. And if the plants that thrive chance not to be the ones that he planted, they are plants nevertheless, and nature is satisfied with them. We are wont to covet the things that we cannot have, but we are happier when we love the things that grow because they must. A patch of lusty pigweeds growing and crowding in luxuriant abandon may be a better and more worthy object of affection than a bed of coleuses in which every spark of life and spirit and individuality has been sheared out and suppressed. The man who worries morning and night about the dandelions in the lawn will find great relief in loving the dandelions. Each blossom is worth more than a gold coin as it shines in the exuberant sunlight of the growing spring and attracts the insects to its bosom. Little children like the dandelions. Why may not we? Love the things nearest at hand and love intensely. If I were to write a motto over the gate of a garden, I should choose the remark that Socrates is said to have made as he saw the luxuries in the market. How much there is in the world that I do not want. I verily believe that this paragraph I have just written is worth more than all the advice with which I intend to cram the succeeding pages, notwithstanding the fact that I have most assiduously extracted this advice from various worthy but happily long forgotten authors. Happiness is a quality of a person, not of a plant or a garden, and the anticipation of joy in the writing of a book may be the reason why so many books on garden making have been written. Of course, all these books have been good and useful. It would be ungrateful, at the least, for the present writer to say otherwise, but books grow old and the advice becomes too familiar. The sentences need to be transposed and the order of the chapters varied now and then, or interest lags. Or, to speak plainly, a new book of advice on handicraft is needed in every decade, or perhaps oftener in these days of many publishers. 
there has been a long and worthy procession of these handbooks gardner and hepburn mcmahon cobbett original pungent versatile cobbett fessenden squib bridgman sayers buist and a dozen more each one a little richer because the others had been written but even the fact that all books pass into oblivion does not deter another hand from making still another venture i expect then that every person who reads this book will make a garden or will try to make one but if only tares grow where roses are desired i must remind the reader that at the outset i advised pigweeds the book therefore will suit everybody the experienced gardener because it will be a repetition of what he already knows and the novice because it will apply as well to a garden of burdocks as of onions what a garden is a garden is the personal part of an estate the area that is most intimately associated with the private life of the home originally the garden was the area inside the enclosure or lines of fortification in distinction from the unprotected area or fields that lay beyond and this latter area was the particular domain of agriculture this book understands the garden to be that part of the personal or home premises devoted to ornament and to the growing of vegetables and fruits the garden therefore is an ill-defined domain but the reader must not make the mistake of defining it by dimensions for one may have a garden in a flower pot or on a thousand acres in other words this book declares that every bit of land that is not used for buildings walks drives and fences should be planted what we shall plant whether sward lilacs thistles cabbages pears chrysanthemums or tomatoes we shall talk about how as we proceed the only way to keep land perfectly unproductive is to keep it moving the moment the owner lets it alone the planting has begun in my own garden this first planting is of pigweeds these may be followed the next year by ragweeds then by docks and thistles with here and there a start of clover and grass and it all ends in june grass and dandelions nature does not allow the land to remain bare and idle even the banks where plaster and lath were dumped two or three years ago are now luxuriant with burdocks and sweet clover and yet persons who pass those dumps every day say that they can grow nothing in their own yard because the soil is so poor yet i venture that those same persons furnish most of the pigweed seed that i use on my garden the lesson is that there is no soil where a house would be built so poor that something worth while cannot be grown on it if burdocks will grow something else will grow or if nothing else will grow then i prefer burdocks to sand and rubbish the burdock is one of the most striking and decorative of plants and a good piece of it against a building or on a rough bank is just as useful as many plants that cost money and are difficult to grow i had a good clump of burdock under my study window and it was a great comfort but the man would persist in wanting to cut it down when he mowed the lawn when i remonstrated he declared that it was nothing but burdock but i insisted that so far from being burdock it was really lapa major since which time the plant and its offspring have enjoyed his utmost respect and i find that most of my friends reserve their appreciation of a plant until they have learned its name and its family connections the dumb place that i mentioned has a surface area of nearly one hundred and fifty square feet and i find that it has grown over two hundred good plants of one kind or another this year this is more than my gardener accomplished on an equal area with manure and water and a man to help the difference was that the plants on the dump wanted to grow and the imported plants in the garden did not want to grow it was the difference between a willing horse and a balky horse if a person wants to show his skill he may choose the balky plant but if he wants fun and comfort in gardening he would better choose the willing one i have never been able to find out when the burdocks and mustard were planted on the dump and i am sure that they were never hoed or watered nature practices a wonderfully rigid economy for nearly half the summer she even refused rain to the plants but still they thrived yet i stayed home from a vacation one summer that i might keep my plants from dying 
I have since learned that if the plants in my hardy borders cannot take care of themselves for a time, they are little comfort to me. The joy of garden making lies in the mental attitude and in the sentiments. End of The Point of View by L. H. Bailey Tea Roses on the Open Ground From the Floral Magazine Coffee Break Collection 33 Gardening This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia Tea Roses on the Open Ground the past summer brought into prominent notice the great advantage of having tea roses on the seedling briar we saw several collections that were in fine bloom right on into the autumn until the rapidly increasing days and want of solar heat prevented the flower from expanding any one having in addition to his collection of tea roses on the seedling briar a little glass accommodation may have tea roses in bloom almost all the year round and thus have the command of cut blooms during nearly every month a large cultivator of tea roses who grows them largely for cut flowers keeps a nursery bed of budded plants constantly in reserve to draw from it plants when required these are planted out in the month of may on a border facing the east and protected at the back by a belt of trees which shelters the plants from westerly gales now cultivators of roses are sometimes recommended to plant their tea roses on a south border but we are informed that it is an erroneous notion to do this as the flowers get scorched up before they can thoroughly expand from being in the full blaze of the sun in the hottest weather when planted on an east border they get the morning sun only for a few hours which is all they want as it is much better for them to be in the shade during the afternoon the ground is well prepared for planting in the winter months it is thoroughly trenched and enriched as may be necessary and thrown up roughly for the frost to act upon it roses for planting out in this way are best grown in pots for a time as they move without any check and generally so much better than when lifted from the open ground up to the end of july all the buds are kept pinched off the result being that the plants bloom all through the remaining summer and autumn months and very freely and finely too if early frosts threaten a little bracken or any suitable litter thrown among them is all the protection they require the glass structure to which we have referred comes in very useful to have tea roses in flower from february onwards if the house be heated with hot water tea roses can be had nearly all through the season when there is an absence of bloom in the open grounds the best varieties of tea roses for planting out in the open ground are the old devoniensis catherine mermay rubens madame falcott madame charles madame camille madame willemos safrano isabella sprunt and gubo all these are charming varieties doing remarkably well on the seedling briar and blooming with great freedom and continuously it would not be difficult to add to these varieties but those named can be fully relied on for the purpose named end of tea roses on the open ground terrariums from indoor gardening artificial lighting terrariums hanging baskets and plant selection prepared by henry m cathy and lowell e campbell coffee break collection thirty three gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain terrariums select plants which are compatible as to growing media light and moisture needs clean all foliage and scrub surfaces with vegetable brush to remove dust disease and insect debris healthy plants must be chosen if the terrarium is to thrive the container chosen for the terrarium must be both clear and waterproof one can use candy jars aquariums condiment or beverage jars or bottles of any size wash the container and remove all labels and traces of the previous contents allow them to dry completely before beginning the terrarium remember that all things that go into the construction of a terrarium should be dry leave all items out to dry at least overnight this will make assembly of the terrarium much easier and permit quick clean-up at the end the following items will be necessary to create a terrarium one a container two coarse sphagnum moss for bottom layer three pasteurized potting mix 
four cuttings and rooted plants five a long stick of pencil diameter to handle plants and six a wash bottle when all material has been assembled do the following put a thin layer of moss on the bottom of the bottle firm with a stick to make a slanting base the depth of the layer depends on bottle size one half to three fourth inch is usually deep enough for most bottles put at least one half to three fourth inch of potting mix over the coarse moss use stick to level and firm up the structure of the potting mix select plants and try to blend their shape foliage color and height carefully remove most of the potting mix from the plants trim all roots two to three inches and remove all diseased or damaged foliage or branches group the plants outside the bottle first to decide on arrangement use stick to guide each plant into the bottle fan out the roots on the potting mix and shift dry potting mix over them firm them into place with a stick tap and shake the bottle to force the growing medium to shift down between the foliage starting at the back of the terrarium add one plant at a time firming all plants and media into place with a stick move the foliage and branches around to face in one direction with the stick working slowly use stick to slide pieces of ground moss or painted gravel into place to cover the bottom of the bottle make sure all surfaces are still dry it should be easy to move place and clean up inside of the terrarium wash the terrarium by using a wash bottle or a thin plastic tube allow water to flow down the inside of the bottle gently and slowly moisten coarse moss potting mix and covering do not sprinkle foliage or add so much water that you can see water standing in the bottom if the terrarium is put together properly you should be able to tilt the terrarium to allow the excess water to drain out when the terrarium is finished place it in a cool lighted shaded area leave top off the bottle and allow all surfaces foliage media bottle to thoroughly dry to clean sides of the bottle use paper toweling on the stick look for damaged or dying leaves and remove them leave the bottle open for several days to correct the relative humidity place top on bottle but do not seal sealed bottles will cause plants to rot a slight exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is necessary for the terrarium to survive display the terrarium by placing it anywhere in the naturally lighted area of the home do not place it where it will be subjected to direct sunlight or near a heating or cooling duct to render the bottle scar-proof paste a piece of felt on the bottom with rubber cement terrariums require a little care if everything has been done properly then a balanced environment will have been created and water loss will be minimal signs that the terrarium needs water are foliage that crinkles at the edges and bottom moss that turns from dark to light brown as before use wash bottle or fine tubing to flow water down the sides of the bottle remember to add water until all surfaces are moistened but allow no excess water to stand in the bottom of the bottle turn the bottle upside down to permit all excess water to drain away do not fertilize the plants at first fertilizing promotes excessive growth which will rapidly fill the bottle after six to nine months add regular house plant type fertilizer using at least one quarter of the concentration recommended for ordinary house plants eventually plants will overgrow the space allotted them when this occurs chemically prune the tips of the plants by touching the growing point with a swab dipped in rubbing alcohol only the tips will die after this treatment and side branches will develop one should expect no more than a useful life of one year for plants in a terrarium poor plants should be discarded after this period and the remaining plants used again in another terrarium plants that make good natural groupings in terrariums are cacti and succulents native understory plants and small leaf house plants do not mix types because they have different media water and light level requirements easy to handle plants are begonia bird's nest fern boxwood calathea Camadorea palm, chlorophytum, the spider plant, 
Eonymus, the creeper, Phytonia, Gynora, the velvet plant, Hedera, the English ivy, Hemigraphus, maidenhair fern, Maranta, the prayer plant, Paperomias, Pilea, the aluminum plant, Scindapsis, the devil's ivy, Tradescantia, and Zabrina. End of Terrariums a tribute to the simple names of old-fashioned flowers by anonymous coffee break collection thirty three gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana a tribute to the simple names of old-fashioned flowers surely there is marked character enough about every plant to give it some simple english name without drawing either upon living characters or dead languages it is hard work to make the morandias and alstromerias and elschotsias the commonest flowers of our modern gardens look passable even in prose they are sad dead letters in the glowing description of a bright scene in june but what are these to the polypostemona petalae and eleuthero macrostemones of watchendorf with such daily additions as the native name of istaktepati kazachitlikahoi or the more classical ponderosity of ivismum perovskinum like the verbum gracium spermagorio kithalakanopolides words that should only be said upon holiday when one has nothing else to do as to poetry attempting to immortalize a modern bouquet it is utterly hopeless and if our cultivars expect to have their new varieties handed down to posterity they must return to such musical sounds as eglantine and cowslip cuckoo pint and primrose or such as our plainer sires gave in larkspur and honeysuckle ragged robin and love lies bleeding before bards will adopt their pets into immortal song end of a tribute to the simple names of old-fashioned flowers the kinds of vegetables to grow from the war gardens by montego free coffee break collection 33 gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ahana malik the kinds of vegetables to grow a number of factors have to be taken into consideration before deciding just which kinds of vegetables to plant in your garden. Some of these factors are the nature of the soil, the size of the garden, the food value of the crop, and the ease with which it may be stored for winter use. Sometimes it is possible to adapt the soil to the crop but usually it is easier to adapt the crop to the soil. A rich loam will support practically all of the vegetables and produce good crops. A thin sandy soil which has not been properly fertilized is only suitable for such crops as bush beans, beets, Swiss chard, tomato and New Zealand spinach. Of course other crops can be grown on such a soil but not very satisfactorily. Potatoes like a sandy soil, but it must be well fertilized. Heavy clay soils will grow cabbage, kale, corn, parsley, parsnips, if the soil is deep, peas and rhubarb. If the soil is shallow, it is not advisable to attempt any of the root crops that make a long root. In this category belong the long beets, parsnips and salsify. 
that person is unwise who attempts to grow potatoes corn and cabbage in a very restricted area these crops need plenty of room in which to develop and when one has only a city backyard or a small plot it is better to concentrate on the smaller growing vegetables the best crops to grow in the city backyard are bush beans parsley radish beets swiss chard and tomato peas would probably succeed if it were not for the sparrows which pick off the leaves as fast as they are produced one is strictly limited if the available ground is shaded all the vegetables need sun for the greater part of the day those kinds which are grown for their leaves are more satisfactory in a shady garden and if the soil conditions are favorable then the following may be tried beet cabbage lettuce and swiss chard even these need a few hours of sunshine those who are interested in dietetics may wish to choose their vegetables on the basis of their food value in terms of the calorie the unit of energy as applied to food we find that 1 ounce of dried beans seeds and 8 ounces of string beans are required to produce 100 calories of green corn 3.2 ounces are needed of potatoes 5.3 ounces of onions 8 ounces of beets 9.6 ounces of cabbage 13.3 ounces and at the bottom of the list comes celery of which 23.7 ounces are required to produce 100 calories it is misleading however to take a list of vegetables with their caloric values and decide that because 6.4 ounces of peas contains 100 calories while it is necessary to have 10.1 ounces of carrots to produce the same amount nothing but peas shall be grown in the garden the proper basis on which to make a decision along these lines is on the amount of calories that can be obtained from each square yard of ground a considerable area is necessary for the production of a pound of peas while a similar weight of carrots could be produced in a much smaller space furthermore it must be remembered that the human system demands a certain amount of bulky foods and these are supplied by vegetables low in caloric values there are a number of crops that can easily be preserved or stored for winter use and these should be considered when deciding what kinds of vegetables to grow string beans are easily preserved by pickling them in brine and there is no difficulty whatever in caring for the dry shell beans when they are not infested with weevils all of the root crops carrots beets parsnips can be easily stored in sand or soil in the cellar and potatoes are one of the easiest of crops to care for onions can readily be carried over into the winter if a cool airy room is available all of the crops just mentioned are fairly high in food value end of the kinds of vegetables to grow cemeteries by mrs skyler van rensselaer coffee break collection 33 gardening This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by Lisa Perkins. Cemeteries. Many foreign writers have praised our rural cemeteries without reserve. The student of social conditions says that they express genuine poetic feeling as well as wise sanitary ideas. and the lover of art and nature finds them our most characteristic achievements in the art of gardening their size their park-like arrangement their remoteness from centers of population and the neatness with which they are kept have often been described as worthy of imitation in european countries 
Certainly, as contrasted with the walled-in, crowded, dreary, sun-baked, weed-grown cemeteries one most often finds in Europe, ours deserve great praise. But they are not what they ought to be. Excellent in intention, they are too often bad in execution. No expenditure of money or pains is shunned, but grievous mistakes are made in determining how money and pains shall be bestowed. Irrespective of the size of the community which it must serve, a modern American cemetery is sure to be a rural cemetery. But we scarcely ever see one in which this fundamental idea has been consistently expressed and then carefully preserved. Nature is asked to take our dead in charge. And then we do a thousand things to ruin the repose, the sanctity, and beauty which she is ready to provide. We cut too many roads and paths, giving the burial ground the look of a pleasuring place rather than the look of a place where the living go to visit the dead. We make ample allowance of space to each purchaser of land, partly that his graves may not be crowded, and partly that they may not destroy the unity and quietness of the landscape. And then we nullify our efforts by enclosing the lots with heavy railings, and by building huge and showy monuments. We think we want a natural landscape, and then we plant the cemetery, not the private lots alone, but also the parts which have been preserved intact for the sake of landscape beauty, with tropical plants and beds of gaudy flowers, and with ribbon patterns, borders, and endless puerile devices, wrought with bright foliaged plants, which support our climate for only a few weeks or months, and then disappear, leaving dreary nakedness behind. In short, we lose sight of the main purpose with which the cemetery was designed, fail to keep any general idea or scheme in mind, and instead of a rural burial ground, produce something which is a meaningless, unnatural, and essentially vulgar compound of a cemetery, a park, a horticultural exhibition, and a collection of works of architecture and sculpture. And this we do by means of a vast waste of pains and money. No one who has not inquired into such matters can imagine what it costs to plant out year by year the exotics which are supposed to adorn our cemeteries and to winter them from one summer to another. Few realize the degree to which cemetery companies now compete with one another in this direction, bidding for public patronage by means of costly horticultural establishments and verbose advertisements of their floral resources and achievements. All this is wrong, wrong from the point of view of good sense from the point of view of true sentiment, and from the point of view of art. The true ideal for the making of an American cemetery, whether large or small, is this. That spot should be selected which has the greatest natural charms in the direction of peacefulness, of effect, and the harmony which means variety in unity. Its features should be as carefully preserved as possible in laying out the walks and drives, and these should not be more numerous than is actually required for purposes of burial and of visiting the graves. Such planting as is needful should be done in a way to complete the existing kind of beauty and accentuate, not disturb, the natural character of the spot. No costly exotics or showy flower beds and no formal plantations of any kind should be allowed. They are out of keeping alike with the kind of beauty that is desired, and with the spirit in which a cemetery is properly visited. Owners of lots should not be permitted to surround them with railings. They are palpably useless. They are glaringly hurtful to peace and unity of aspect. They serve merely to accentuate the fact of proprietorship, and nothing could be in worse taste than such accentuation in such a place. Furthermore, Owners should be encouraged to make their monuments, not merely as artistic, but also as simple and unobtrusive as possible. Only a great man, one to whose grave strangers are likely to come as pilgrims, is entitled to a conspicuous tomb. Even he does not require it. 
and the usual tenant of a grave requires no more than a sign to show that a grave is here and to tell whose grave it is. The best tombstone in a rural cemetery is the one which, in form and color, is least strikingly apparent. Therefore, a flat slab is better than a vertical stone or shaft, and gray slate or granite is a good material. Red granite is a poor material, and the very worst of all is our favorite white marble. But the ideal monument for a rural cemetery is, I think, a natural rock or boulder. Of course, such a stone might be so set that, looking out of place, it would seem more artificial than a carven one. There is nothing so artificial as a patent affectation of simplicity. But very often one may be found set by nature in a spot convenient for a grave, or may be so set by man as to have a perfectly natural look. And then, with a space smoothed for the inscription, but the rest of its moss-grown or vine-wreathed surface left untouched, it is a simple, serious, dignified, and artistic monument, worthy of the noblest dead. Too often, a committee charged with the erection of a civic memorial thinks it can dispense with an artist's aid. Too often, a group or figure or architectural design, especially if it be for a soldier's monument, is ordered as a plain block of stone might be. The commission for its material is given to a stone yard or a quarry company, and the art is thrown in some nameless and artless artisan in the company's employ being bidden to produce, often in the space of a few weeks, such a thing as a great artist could not execute without many months of careful study. Gradually, however, we are coming to realize that this is not the way to secure monuments for public display. Gradually, we are learning that the artist's part in them is quite as important as the stonecutters or the masons. But just in the place where one might think good taste would most surely prevail and no care or pains would be counted too great, just here we do even worse than with our public monuments. In our cemeteries we still feel that we can dispense altogether with the artist's aid. When we commemorate our own beloved dead, we think less of true beauty in the result than when we buy a dress or furnish a drawing room. The stone yard stands close to the cemetery's gate, and to the stone yard we contentedly go when we want a slab or headstone, or even an emblematic figure or an elaborate architectural monument. There is a chance for the exercise of true art in the designing of even the simplest headstone, and there is the certainty of a hideous result when anything more complicated is designed without an artist's help. The big, awkward tombs, the tall, ungraceful shafts, the clumsy, meaningless, hideous figures, and the commonplace, ill-proportioned headstones which fill our cemeteries would be exasperating if they were not so pitiful. They are tributes of true affection, often costing, one cannot doubt, a great deal more than their givers could rightly afford to pay and thus, in their distressing failure to be either beautiful or expressive, they bring a tear to the eye rather than a word of scorn or anger to the lips. If, in thus telling other people that we loved our dead, we could consent to speak less loudly and more carefully, how beautiful, how touching and impressive a cemetery might be. The price now paid for a big monument, bad in design and worse in ornamentation, might persuade even a great artist to design a cross or headstone which, in its simple way, would be an object of the utmost value. Such an object would really honor the memory of our dead, instead of simply shouting out their names with a crude and vulgar voice and the association of many such would make our cemeteries really beautiful spots. Now they usually look like stonecutters' yards on an extended scale. I know one rural cemetery near Boston where the trustees have taken this matter of monuments, as well as the matter of planting, into their own hands. A skillful architect has made for them a number of tombstone designs, 
some more elaborate than others, but all simple enough to be executed by an ordinary stone cutter. Among these designs, the lot owner can choose, and if he cares for none of them, he must submit his own for the trustee's sanction. Nor may he plant his lot as he pleases. All the planting is done under the trustee's supervision. There is none of a formal and none of a showy or expensive kind. Wildflowers are encouraged to grow. Native trees and shrubs are preserved wherever desirable and hardy flowers have been planted where they could help the general effect of the landscape. Of course, no enclosures are permitted around the lots. And while the grass is shorn in the occupied parts, and all parts are kept appropriately neat, there is no excess of mere tidiness and trimness. For a cemetery is not a park or a garden. It is not a place for pleasure-seeking or an environment for the homes of men. It is the home of the dead. It is God's acre. It should prove a guardian's presence, but not a horticulturalist's enthusiasm. Nature made this spot very beautiful, with shady woods and with a varied surface, often distinctly picturesque and yet not too wild or broken to seem a true God's acre for the peaceful resting of the dead. And the truest kind of art has done all that it could first to preserve and then to accentuate nature's scheme. Richardson lies buried in this cemetery, and if other artists could see how quiet and beautiful it is, how satisfying to both eye and mind, how far superior from every point of view to the usual burial ground, which seems to have been given over to the running of a race in crude display between gardener and stonecutter, then I think all the artists in America might ask to lie near Richardson. End of chapter 11. Cemeteries. How to make a start with community gardening. From War Gardens by Montague Free, head gardener of the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. Published in 1918. Coffee Break Collection 33 gardening this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording is by michelle fry baton ridge louisiana in january 2022 community gardens how to make a start in casting about for ways and means of starting a food garden by all means investigate the advisability of joining up with or inaugurating a community garden there are tremendous possibilities in connection with cooperative efforts in developing vacant lots and making them productive not in the sense of the real estate man but as food producing plots designed to reduce the cost of living and incidentally in many cases to clean up and make presentable what was formerly a neighborhood eyesore there are many advantages to be gained by a neighborhood group combining together for gardening operations usually it is not difficult in most cities to find large plots of vacant land with owners who are only too glad to have them cultivated by cooperative effort it is possible to hire a team and plow and have such plots ploughed at a trifling expense whereas by individual effort it is seldom possible to obtain sufficient land to warrant the expense of hiring a team for ploughing even though the plot were large enough for the team to turn around on a community garden organization can buy garden tools such as wheelbarrows wheel hoes a sprayer and other comparatively costly items which greatly facilitate the work of caring for the plot but which it would be impossible or unwise for an individual to buy if he wished to come anywhere near making a profit on his garden seeds and fertilizers can be bought to much greater advantage and more cheaply when obtained in bulk with the added advantage that of such seeds as tomato eggplant peppers and celery one packet is usually enough for the whole organization whereas by individual effort it would be necessary for each gardener to buy his own packet of seed resulting in considerable waste 
waste is not to be condoned at any time especially now when seeds of some vegetables are scarce i have in mind a community organization a description of which will serve to illustrate what can be done by organized effort of this kind a piece of land about three acres in extent was available for cultivation in this case it was fairly good land but had served to some extent as a dumping ground for cellar excavations and had a considerable amount of rubbish of one kind or another deposited upon it the principal of an adjacent school decided that this land ought not to remain idle so he obtained permission from the owner to use it and then with some other energetic people of the community got together and started to do things the ground was first ploughed and harrowed free of charge by the city park department and the largest of the stones removed it was then decided that the plot should be fenced in order to keep out cats dogs small boys and other undesirables and to ensure that those who raised the crops should receive the benefit material consisting of two by four inch posts eight feet long chicken netting five feet wide and a strand of barbed wire to go around the top was bought for this purpose at a cost of one hundred and twelve dollars the fence was erected by volunteers in their spare time and six padlocked gates provided to which each plot holder had a key water pipe was laid all over the area so that the crops could be cared for in time of drought the expense incurred for the purchase of pipe and installation together with that of seeds fertilizers and the larger garden implements was borne by the association the area was divided into fifty plots each one hundred by twenty three and a half feet each plot holder was asked to keep an account of his expenses and also of the yields obtained the results were interesting the average cost of each plot including expenses incurred for fencing seeds fertilizer etc was a little over eleven dollars the value of the crops obtained was around thirty four dollars giving an average profit of between twenty two and twenty three dollars when one considers the smallness of these plots it must be admitted that the results were worth while and the whole adventure is very encouraging to those who contemplate a similar enterprise of course no allowance was made for the cost of labor involved in preparing and caring for these plots but to offset this one should remember that the soil was not especially good the workers were not experienced and then one must take into account the large initial expense of fencing the land buying tools etc this year the expenses will be considerably less and the yields ought to be greatly increased because of the improvement of the soil through the cultivation of the preceding year other advantages of community gardens that may be mentioned are these there is not so much danger of a plot holder becoming tired of gardening and quitting before he has harvested his crop community gardening fosters a spirit of healthy competition and each gardener tries to have his plot looking a little neater and to produce larger and better crops than his neighbor furthermore in a body of men and women associated in this way there is almost always someone who has had a garden before and to whom the novices may turn for advice while community gardening is undoubtedly the most economical and in many ways the most pleasurable method for the home gardener to produce his crops one should not be deterred from the attempt to grow vegetables merely because there is no opportunity to link up with an organization the man with a backyard can grow some vegetables provided that his soil is fairly good and his plot is open to the sunshine even the apartment dweller need not despair because in most cities it is possible to obtain the use of a plot of vacant ground through either the municipality or some organization formed for the purpose of dealing with such situations end of how to make a start with community gardens